Hello, my name's Nicola Davis and I'm speaking to you from my studio um, above my kitchen uh, in West Wales in the UK. Uh, because I'm speaking to you from here, I just have to make a few excuses uh, for sounds you might hear. Um, my husband is downstairs, so you might hear him talking on the telephone. Uh, you might hear the chickens outside. We have a, a young cockerel who has recently learned to crow. Um, so you might hear him trying out his voice. Uh, and you might hear various bird sounds because uh, there are lots of birds around here and they fly over and the sound comes in through the roof. So uh, lovely to see you. I'm really sorry that I can't be speaking to you properly in person right there in Brooklyn. I'm especially sorry because the last time I was in Brooklyn I had the most wonderful day. I was working in a public school, public primary school in Brooklyn and they gave me the most wonderful welcome. The kids were fantastic um, and the headmistress was a total total darling in fact all the staff were lovely but at the end of the day the headmistress gave me a massive hug and she said if ever you come back to New York this is your home in Brooklyn so I'm hoping that one day when all this horrible virus Covid nonsense that we're all currently enduring when it's all over that I will be able to come back to lovely New York City and wonderful Brooklyn uh, and maybe go back to that school and maybe even come to Brooklyn Public Library. That would be fantastic. Um, so I need to explain a little bit about myself because you probably don't know me from a hole in the wall. Um, I'm a writer for children. Um, my background is in zoology. Um, I trained as somebody who was going to spend their life studying animals in the wild and I did that for a while. I studied birds and bats and several species of whale in the wild so I've been lucky enough to go to sea and stand on the decks of small boats and see what sperm whales and blue whales and humpbacks get up to on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, and then for a while I, I worked in television. I worked for the BBC Natural History Unit, which specialises in making natural history programmes. Um, and I made that change because I felt that as an academic, I was really just preaching to the choir, you know, telling people stuff they already knew. And I really wanted to be in a situation where I could tell a bigger audience about the importance of the natural world and how we need to really kind of get on with caring about it um, and that's a message now that is obviously more important than ever um, but many of the programs that I worked on were programs for children now that suited me very well because although I'm you know ancient on the outside I'm actually eight on the inside so I really enjoy being with children um, and talking to children and writing things for children and I also care very deeply about children's development, about their education, about their well-being. Uh, and so I do lots of work in schools and at literary festivals. Uh, I run workshops of all sorts, um, mostly for children, to help them to find their voice as writers and also as illustrators and to help them see the power of their own creative thinking. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is mostly this book, Every Child a Song, which is a, a book about the United Nations Convention on Rights of the Child. But before I start on that, there are a few sort of general things I want to talk to you about, um, about writing, about the title of this talk, which is Finding the Thread. So what do I mean by finding the thread. Um, when you write a book, any book, mostly my books are picture books and actually picture books are where my heart really lies, although at the moment I'm kind of 50,000 words into an 80,000 word novel. Um, whatever you write, there are, there are two layers of what I call aboutness. Now I know that sounds like a crazy word, it's an invented word, aboutness. Um, but what I mean by that is that there's, there's the topic that you're writing about, but then there's also the, so that's the what of what you write. And then there's the how of what you write. And the how of what you write is, is the really complicated bit. That's the bit that, that influences the what in all sorts of subtle ways. 
Okay, so let me give you an example. Say you decide you want to write a book about rhinos. Okay, so you want to write a book about rhinos. So, okay, there's lots of facts about rhinos. You know, they're big, where they live, their horns, what they eat, how long they live, how they have their babies, the fact that they're hunted, uh, the fact that they're now threatened because of that hunting. Where do you start with that? You've got this great big bowl of facts, like a bowl of beads. And what you need is a thread to string them on. And the thread that you string them on is the narrative, the story. Now, when I say narrative story, I don't necessarily mean kind of an adventure story where lots of things happen and, you know, people go on a journey and there's a quest and there's this and that. What I mean is a piece of writing with a beginning, a middle and an end, a shape. Now that shape, that story shape, is like, it's like a carrier bag inside your head. And that carrier bag is what's going to hold the factual material, the information that you want to put over to your, to your readers. And what you need to construct is that, is that story carrier bag. So how do you go about doing that? Well, that's the really, really tricky part. The first thing to think about is, OK, if you've got a narrative, you've got a story, then you've got a narrator, a storyteller. So who is going to tell this story? Is it going to be you? Is it going to be somebody else? If it's somebody else, are you going to stand right in the middle of their head and tell it from their point of view? Or are you going to stand a little bit outside them and look at them? Or are you going to stand somewhere totally different and look back at the information that you are trying to convey? Um, and those decisions, as you make them, as you discover them, then influence the track of your story and how it interacts with your big bowl of beads of information. And sometimes what you find is that you choose a story thread, a narrative thread, that not all those beads are going to fit on. Now that doesn't matter. When you are, particularly when you're writing non-fiction, it doesn't matter that you don't tell your readers absolutely everything. Your job is to tell them something that they will remember. It's much more important to tell them one thing that they're going to that's actually going to stick in their heads than 10 things that would just be too much. Because if they know one thing and they're interested, then they'll go and read something else. They'll go and find out something else. Your job is to strike the flame, to get them interested, to get them turning the pages so that they then go on to make their own journeys of discovery. And actually, to a certain extent, even with fiction, that's true. You don't need to tell everything on the first page. You just need to tell enough for them to keep turning the pages. Now, it's probably much easier if I just give you a couple of illustrations of how I've gone about doing this. Um, so this year, um, this book was published and it's about, um, it's, it's a story, but it's actually also a non-fiction book because I wanted to write something about albatrosses. Now, I don't know if you know about albatrosses. They're one of my favourite, favourite, favourite creatures in all of the world. Um, they are very, very big seabirds. They have a massive wingspan, over two metres. Uh, and they live in places where the, steep, where the seas are very stormy uh, and where the wind is always blowing. They really specialise in flying in high winds. Uh, in fact, high winds, are, they, they need them. They need that high wind to be able to fly. Um, and they cover enormous distances, wandering over huge, huge areas of ocean and seeing things probably that we human beings will never experience. And they breed on very remote um, islands. The problem is these days, that they get into trouble because of human fisheries. Uh, they get caught on hooks, 
when uh, people are catching uh, catching fish to eat on lines that are maybe miles long with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hooks, baited hooks, because the albatrosses see the bait in the water and they think, hmm, that's a nice easy meal, uh, and get caught on the hooks. And hundreds of thousands, millions of seabirds, including albatrosses, are killed every year. Um, and I wanted to tell that story, but I also wanted to tell it from the point of view of the fishermen, because very often the fishermen who are working on those boats they have a really, really hard life too. They're not just kind of baddies killing off seabirds for no reason. They're desperately trying to make a living. And I don't know if you've ever had the experience of being on a boat in rough weather, as I have. Um, it's, it's tough. You know, it's one of the toughest, most dangerous jobs that you can do in all the world. So I wanted to tell their story too. So I had lots of information about albatrosses, about how they get caught on hooks. I had information about the fishermen. I had to decide where I was going to set it because I could have set it in lots of different parts of the world. But I decided that I was going to set it in Chile, um, where there are lots of small boats that go out into the cold waters, the cold current that runs up the Chilean coast and is full of life. Um, and some of that life is hunted by albatrosses and also by people and albatross get caught on human uh, human hooks. So how was I going to tell it? Was I going to tell it first person? No, I didn't want to do that because I wanted to be able to stand back and look at the albatross and the people. So I wanted to be able to see all of it and show all that to my readers. So I decided I would tell the story of the people who work on this little boat. She's She's called the Magdalena, uh, and uh, she's crewed by her, by her owner, this little boy's dad, and there's the dad, and, uh, and his brother. So a dad, an uncle, and a son are working on this boat. Um, and what has happened before this story starts is that the mum has died very far away from home. Like many uh, Central and South American people, she's uh, left home to try and make some money for her family. Uh, and while she was away, she died, so she never made it home. And what happens is that this little boy, here he is, he rescues an albatross that gets caught on one of his dad's fishing lines. And he feels very sorry for this albatross because he feels that this is a female albatross. He doesn't know why he thinks that. It's very hard to tell male and female albatrosses apart. Um, and he feels sorry for her because she is far from home, just like his mum was. So through this story of the family, the father and the son and the uncle, kind of coming to terms with their grief, they also, uh, the boy also rescues the albatross. So the human and the natural world are combined um, and the setting is real. Um, it's all based on a real place in Chile um, and the albatross is real. And although the family is made up, it's based on a lot of research that I did about families like that who have small fishing boats. Uh, and it's, as I say, told in the third person. Um, this book is about bullying. Now, I wanted to write about bullying, which may seem quite a long way from the natural world. Um, I don't. Most of my books are about nature, but occasionally I write books that are just about children because um, because I really care about kids. Uh, I've worked working with children now as a broadcaster um, and also as a writer now for more than thirty years. Uh, and I've had children of my own and I've got lots of kids in my family. Um, but mostly really because I'm, although I'm old on the outside, I'm eight on the inside. So I'm very comfortable with children um, and I care very much about their well-being and their welfare. So I wanted to write a book about bullying. Now, when I was at school, I changed schools lots because my parents moved around. Uh, and so I was very often 
the new girl. Uh, and I was very often the stranger, um, the outsider, uh, and I was teased, bullied. Um, I was a fatal combination of clever and fat. It's not good. So I got teased because I was clever and I got teased because I was fat and I wasn't very good at standing up for myself. But rather shamefully, I did join in, join in with the bullying of kids who were even lower in the pecking order than me on a couple of occasions because I was so relieved just to, for once to feel part of the group. Uh, and that's the awful thing about bullying. That's how it that's how it gets people to behave really, really badly because you just want to feel that you're part of something. So I wanted to write about bullying from both sides of the story. So although this book is called The New Girl, it's not told from her point of view. It's told from the point of view of the bully. Uh, the bully who... Well, I won't tell you what happens in the end, but they the bully learns that she's not been very nice and she's quite sorry about it in the end. But it begins like this. The new girl didn't look like us. She didn't understand a thing we said, even when we shouted. She was wrapped up like a parcel. We wondered what she hid beneath those clothes. And there's that first illustration by the wonderful... Kathy Fisher, uh, and there's the new girl, and there are all her new classmates standing in the shadows looking at her rather threateningly, and one of those is the person who's talking in this story. Okay, so this book, Every Child a Song, um, the story of how this came to be written, because of course every story also has a story, um, is that I was asked to write it by a publisher, a British publisher called Wren and Rook. Now, that's quite rare for me. Usually with my books, I come up with the idea. Um, I write a, you know, a proposal about how absolutely marvellous and wonderful and brilliant and everything it's going to be. And I put that in front of my publisher and either they go, chuck it away, or they go, yeah, that sounds all right go away and write it. Um, but very, very occasionally, uh, a publisher will come to me and say, we would like a book about this, please can you write it? Uh, and so this publisher, who were a new publisher to me, um, asked me to write a book about the United Nations Convention on Rights of the Child. Now, because I care so deeply about children, that was a subject that was very, very close to my heart. Now, if you don't know about the UNCRC, that's what it is for short. It's some of the most powerful international law ever put together. And nearly all the countries in the world have agreed to, uh, to keep these laws. Now, I, I have to tell you, sadly, that the United States, almost alone amongst all nations is the one country that hasn't signed up um, signed up to the UN Convention on Rights of the Child. I'm sure, I'm sure you will, but you haven't yet. Uh, and what this convention does is it, it, it aims to protect every single child in the world. Protect them uh, and make sure that they can grow up to be the best they can be. So, some of the rights are very, very simple. And you would think that perhaps we don't have to have them written down, but sadly it seems we do. The right to life. The right to be brought up by your family. The right to an education. The right to play with other children. Uh, and the right to all those things, e no matter what you are, no matter where you come from, no matter um, what difficulties you may be struggling against. There are also uh, rights in the UN Convention on Rights of the Child that protect children who are refugees, that protect children with disabilities, that protect children um, who are in danger of being made slaves or made into child soldiers or trafficked in some way. 
it's a very, very long list and it's written in very precise legal language. So, you know, for an ordinary person, it, it's quite difficult to understand. Now, if you're interested, if you go on to the, uh, the UN Convention on Rights of the Child, um, they have a website and you can look at the rights and there um there's a sort of there's a sort of short easy to understand version but even that is pages and pages long and also it's a list now i know that under some circumstances lists can be quite interesting but mostly i i don't know with lists i just tune out after about the third one you know so when i was asked to write this book I went to see this publisher and they have a great big posh office on the side of the Thames in London. Um, and it's, you know, it's very, very, very swish. And I went into this office in my best clothes, you know, my hair straight and looking as respectable as I could look. And um, I had a conversation with the editor who was really, really lovely. Uh, and they said what they wanted out of this book. And basically... What they really wanted was a list, a list written for children, but a list. Uh, and I said, yeah, yeah, fine, I can do that. Yep, 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 yep. And they're right on the top floor. And I went down the lift after I'd agreed to do this. And by the time I got to the bottom, I thought, oh, no, no, I don't think I can do a list. And I walked out of the front gate and I walked down the road. And by the time I got down the road, I thought, I really can't do a list. But I can think maybe of something a bit more exciting than a list, something that will get people interested in the, the meaning of the rights of a child and how important they are and how they need to be celebrated. I'm sure I could write something like that. So I got home and I wrote an email to the publisher and I said, lovely to meet you, you know, fantastic swishy offices. Um, and this is a great subject and it really needs to be written about. But if you want a list, you, you need to get somebody else to do it because I, I don't want to do it. But I could do something a bit more exciting. I could write you something that is a narrative that carries the sense of this incredibly important piece of international law that protects, aims to protect every single child on the planet. And I'm very, very lucky that they, I think, I'm sure they were very worried about it, but they said, oh, okay, go away and do that. Um, so yeah. that's what I went away to do. Um, and finding the thread with this was really difficult. I read about the rights, uh, I read about how they are used. I read, of course, about how many millions of children around the world still do not have some of the basic rights set out in the UNCRC. They don't have the right to an education. They don't have the right to good health care. They don't even have the right to life. Um, and so there's a lot of work to do around the world. And so that made me feel that I was doing something that really, really was worthwhile, trying to get people interested in this idea of children's rights. I spent a long time thinking and thinking and thinking and staring at a blank computer screen. Now, one of the things that's, that's really important in my life is, is singing. Singing and voice, and the idea of a voice. Now, the word voice has a lot of meanings, doesn't it? It's, it's the way you speak, it's the sound of your voice, it's your accent, which I'm sure you are probably all struggling with, um, with my accent. But it's also your voice as a human being in the world, and your voice being able to speak up for yourself, being able to speak up for yourself in class, being able to speak up for yourself in your workplace, being able to speak up for yourself in your family. And I know just from my own experience, from my own life, that sometimes having a voice 
having a voice in the world is 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 really hard it's a really really hard thing and sometimes we need to help each other to find our voices so i was thinking about that and how that related to the rights of children and then i was thinking also about the time the magical time the magical days when my children who are now 31 and 32 when my children were born and how fantastic and unique and special it feels as a mummy when you have this new little person in your arms this new little person who is a unique combination of two other people and all the other people that went before them that is a unique genetic mix um that the world has never seen before and then i was i was uh, listening to some music and listening to the melody and thinking about melody thinking about tune and how a new tune a new melody is something so special when you hear a new melody your ears kind of prick up don't they and you think oh Mm, I haven't heard that before. And then those two things stuck together for me uh, and I realised that I had the beginning, I had the first bit of the thread that was going to give me the narrative of this book. Now, it's still not a list. It still doesn't say, well, this is the right to do this. This is the right to do that. It's not a list. But the rights that are um, set out in the UN Convention on Rights of the Child are implied in this story. It's a poem, really, actually. That's what it is. It's a poem that carries um, that carries the sense of... Uh, of what the UN Convention on Rights of the Child is trying to do, trying to protect and empower children around the world and to give them the strength to stand up for themselves and to inspire other people to stand up for children who are not able to do that for themselves. So it's an incredibly wonderful thing, really. It's the very best of what human beings can be. You know, we know a lot and we hear a lot about what the worst that human beings can be. But at our best, we're, we're really good. If we could be our best a bit more often, it'd be much better, wouldn't it, really? Um, I'm going to read it to you. But before I do that, I need to say something about, um, about illustration. And I'll say a little bit more about illustration when I finish reading it. But obviously, with a picture book, it's not just the words, it's the illustration. Now, um, as the author of many picture books, I find them they're the most difficult thing to write, picture books, because every single word has to multitask. Every page turn has to work like uh, like the change in scene of a, a of a theatre production. It, they really have to come in the right place. Um, see, there's a awful lot of thinking and struggling and rewriting and this and that that goes into the text of a picture book but as the writer there comes a point where you have to let go and let the illustrator do their thing and the role that illustration plays in a picture book is very very similar to the role that the music plays in a song so you have the lyrics the words of the song and then you have the melody of the song um, and the illustration is the melody uh, and the two together as you know if you think of your very favorite song some bit of some word and some note that makes your heart turn over you know how powerful that is uh, and the music and the words together are much much more as a combination than they are on their own and that's the same for picture books and that is the power of picture books um i don't know you may think that picture books are something just for little kids but they're absolutely 
not. Picture books have an extraordinary power to speak across ages and cultures and nations uh, and they can package up the biggest and most difficult subjects for absolutely everybody to understand. I've written I've written picture books about uh, children caught in war zones. I've written about uh, I've written about families who have lost family members. I've written about grief. I've written about disability, and I've written about really complex things like microbiology and genetics, uh, and done all those through a medium of picture books. Six hundred words that hopefully explain, help, tell the story of that situation or that information for an audience of everybody actually so picture books are a unique art form and there are some fantastic picture book authors and illustrators out there at the moment okay so this is every child a song so i'll read it and i'll hold up the picture so that you can see something that's the first page with a mum and a little baby at a window. When you were born, a song began. Sometimes it didn't sound much like a song. Sometimes no one could hear it. But it was there in every heartbeat, every breath, tiny, fragile and unique. A melody the world had never heard before. It needed love to help it grow, to keep it sheltered and protected, nourished, cherished, celebrated. It needed naming and belonging, a home to call its own, arms to hold it safe in warmth and welcome. Then, with each new step and word, your song picked up its rhythm. It soared, explored. It learned the blue of sky, the green of leaves, the red of dawn and sunset. All around you, everywhere, other songs are singing. Some are loud and some are quiet. Some sing a single note, and some a symphony. But whatever melody a song sings, each one is true and beautiful, unique and special as your own. No song should be worn away to silence. No song should be drowned out. Nor stolen, made to sing the tune of darkness, hate and war. Even amongst storm and change and danger, Every song must be heard above the noise and chaos of the world. Because when every child is born, a song begins. A melody the world has never heard before, unique and tiny fragile but never quite alone for together we raise our voices for the right of every song to sing out loud bold and unafraid so small new song. Sing on, lifelong, 
Sing love. Sing joy. Sing freedom. And that's the end. Uh, and at the very end, there are there is a list actually. <laughs> there is a list of some of the rights uh, that are enshrined in the UNCRC. Now, I think you'll agree with me that Mark Martin, who's the illustrator, has done the most extraordinary job here. Um, and he's used birds lots of times to... So there, because birds have songs and birds sing. So there's the baby bird in the nest. And here, on the page where it talks about um, not being stolen or made to sing the tune of darkness, hate and war. I think this is a really wonderful, powerful page. So there's a little child actually sitting in a prison and there outside you see the bird. And the bird is kind of, that's what the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is. It's that bird, it's that sunlight, it's the sunlight falling in on this imprisoned child saying, you do have rights. And there are people outside this prison who are fighting for your rights, who hopefully have got your back and will get you out of there. Um, and that's what this page is about. So together we raise our voices for the right of every song to sing out loud, bold and unafraid. Um, and one of the rights in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is actually an obligation that is put on all governments to make sure that the children in their country have those rights. And so that's what that page is all about. It's up to all of us to stick together and make sure that children all around the world have these rights, the right to life, the right to education, the right to be taken care of, the right to be loved and cared for, as all children should be. Um, now, I've just got one more thing that I really want to say to you. Um, it's partly about just picture books, but it's also about the power of story uh, and what story can do. Uh, and I'm actually going to show you an illustration from my very, very first picture book, uh, simply because it, it, it shows what I'm trying to say. Now, this is a picture book that is about, it's about blue whales. So that's the first level of aboutness. But it's the other level of aboutness is about how we see blue whales and how we perceive their size. Now, I don't know if you can see there. This is a very big version. So just, I'm going to just take a good look at this, okay? There you go. So you can see there two kids, two children, standing on the fin of a blue whale. Now, I've got a question for you. Those two children are standing on the fin of a blue whale. Where are they? Are they in air? Well, if they were in air the blue whale's body would collapse under its own weight and it would die, it wouldn't be able to breathe. If they were in water, the children would drown. So where are they? They are in story space now. This is the magical, magical space that human beings have invented. And in that space, in story space, you can put together real things, imaginary things, you can put together things that have been with things that might be. You can combine anything you want from any area of human knowledge, from history, from chemistry, from art, from science. You can put them together and you can create something new. Now, the reason that is so important and so important now, more important than it's ever, ever been, is that I'm sure you know, human beings are really up against it. We have got a lot of problems. And we've got a lot of problems 
mostly because we've been doing things without really thinking very hard about their effects. So we have an environmental crisis that is manifesting itself in all sorts of ways. So in the next 100 years, we have a lot of battles to fight and we are going to have to find new ways of doing very nearly everything. Now, we need stories because we need stories to tell us about all the knowledge we already have, about all the experiences we've already had. We've already, we've already had. But we also need stories because stories tell us about what could be. The very first seed of changing the way the world is, is imagining it. Is imagining how it might be, how you might change it, how you want the world to be. And that's the power of stories and storytelling. It helps us to imagine the world anew, in a new and different way. And that's what story space can do. And that's why story space is so, so important. That's why imagining is so incredibly important. Now, if you are somebody who wants to write stories and maybe is struggling, there are a few things to remember. First of all, that what you're doing is important. Finding your voice as a storyteller is important because we need a diversity of storytellers. We need all sorts of different stories, all sorts of different imaginings. So that's the first thing to remember. The second thing to remember is that the way you work and the way you think and the way your mind works is completely unique. Now that's tricky because that means that you have to find your own way of writing or drawing or painting, whatever it is. You have to find your own route because nobody can really tell you how to do it the way you do it. But once you have found that way, and I don't know what it is for you, it might be you need to lie under a tree, you need to jump up and down in your bed, you need to eat uh, endless chocolates I don't know whatever it is that works for you if it works for you that's fine you have found your way don't let anybody tell you it's the wrong way so long as it's not hurting you or hurting anybody else it's fine if staring out of the window and in thinking that you're not thinking about anything with your brain just going blah, 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 is what works for you because that, that works very well for me I have to say um then don't anybody don't let anybody ever tell you don't don't stare out the window don't imagine don't daydream a friend of mine once told me that when you are daydreaming you're actually sharpening your axe I think that's absolutely wonderful when you're daydreaming your brain is actually sharpening its ability to be creative, to come up with something new. And actually having that downtime when you're just looking at the light coming through the trees or uh, traffic going along the road or when your brain is in that floaty state, that is a really, really, really important part of creativity. If you, if you read or you listen to um, great scientists, artists, thinkers, Anybody who's come up with something really new and interesting, if you hear them talking about their process, some kind of daydreaming is always there. It's always part of it. Daydreaming and playing. Uh, and that's the other thing that I want to say to you about writing. I know that when you stare at a blank cons computer screen or a blank piece of paper, it can be really scary and it can make you freeze because you think, oh, what word am I going to put down first? And you put one, down, one word down, it really leaps out at you and you think, oh, no, that's the wrong word. And you, you can spend forever just fiddling around with the first sentence because you're paralysed with fear. Um, so there isn't really a, an easy way around this. You've just got to do it. You've just got to do it. 
Just get on with it. Just do it. Just get the words down on the page. Just give yourself something to play around with uh, and something to edit. And it and if that doesn't get you going, the next thing to do is write about something you care about, something you have some knowledge about. Or um, go and do something new, even if the new thing is something really tiny, like taking a bus you've never taken before or walking down a street you've never walked down before and write about that as it happens. Have a little notebook with you all the time. And if you're a writer, draw. Actually, if you're anything, draw. Do you know what draw, why drawing is so important? Even if you're drawing is you look at it and you think, well, that's rubbish, don't look anything like that. Drawing makes you look. It makes you focus and concentrate. Uh, and I use drawing very, very much to help me do that. And also drawing can help you get your brain into that slightly floaty state where you're not thinking about, what am I going to have for my tea tonight? I've got to go shopping. I've got to, you know, all that stuff that we all have to worry about in the day. It can get you out of that and get your brain into a much better place. So notebooks, drawing, daydreaming. Absolutely crucial to anybody in any field of creativity, whether you are an artist or a scientist. And of course, the other thing for writers, read. Just read anything, anything and everything. Read poetry, lots and lots of poetry, and there's a huge, huge variety of uh, of poems and poets out there. You will find somebody who, when you open the page, you'll think, I know that, I feel that. You will. You've just got to look. Just got to look until you find the right person. Don't try with the people who don't work for you. Ditch them. Go on, find somebody who does work for you. Um, and everything that you read will be helping to make you into a writer. It will be patterning your brain. Um, when I was a little girl, I was really lucky because my parents were both big readers. Now, I don't come from a, you know, a, a, a rich, posh family. My father was the first um, person in his family to stay on at school after 14 and to go to university that was a really big deal um, and my grandfather was a coal miner um, and my grandfather on the other side was a steel worker so I come from a long line of miners and steel workers and small holders um, pe not people who went to university not people who had houses full of books and who had lots of money but both my parents really cared about words and uh, and they loved words. And my father knew lots of poems by heart. And he would recite poetry to me. Now, some of those poems I have been saying to myself even before I really understood what the words meant. And they are still in my head. And I think learning poetry and having poetry that you carry around in your heart, and it's always there for you, no matter what happens to you, it's right there. And you can call on it for comfort, for joy, just like a sort of, like a sort of cuddle blanket, really. Do you know what a cuddle blanket is? One of those little blankets you have when you were really small? One of those. Poetry can be like that. It can be inspiration. It can help you find the right words when your own words fail you. And the other thing that it does is it teaches your brain it teaches your brain about language. Uh, and all the time that you're reading, all the time that you're learning those words, you are teaching yourself to be a writer. You are helping yourself to find your own unique voice through seeing and experiencing the unique voice of somebody else who's been in the world before you. Um, so I've talked at you now for 50 minutes and I'm sure you're completely sick of the side of me. Um, it's been very, very lovely to talk to you. Um, and like I say, I'm incredibly sorry that uh, I can't do it in person. Um, if you have questions, it is possible to get in touch with me. Um, I'm on social media. I'm on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, and my uh, my handle is at Nicola Kids Books. So if you've got a question, 
that's one way of getting your question to me. Uh, and if you use the hashtag Brooklyn Public Library, then I'll know where you came from and uh, I'll do my very best to get back to you and answer your questions as soon as I can. Um, I would say in the next little while I have this book to finish which is really big and it's filling my whole head so I really don't have any um, headspace for anything else but I will answer your questions as soon as I can but forgive me if it takes me a day or so to get back to you but I will get back to you. Um, it's been really lovely talking to you. I hope it's helped you to understand a little bit more about picture books, about how they work and why they work and how incredibly important they are. I would totally, totally commend picture books to you, no matter what age you are. There are fantastic, fantastic ones out there. Um, one immediately that springs to mind that is very appropriate for um, winter in New York City is... Uh, a picture book written and illustrated by the amazing Sydney Smith, who's Canadian. And it's called Small in the City. And it's absolutely, exquisitely beautiful. So if you want something about the city, that's the one to go for. Uh, and if, if you want something that's going to take you into wildlife and countryside, uh, then the book uh, Lost Spells by my friend uh, Jackie Morris and Robert McFarlane will be out in the US soon. So two lovely things to uh, read over the holidays. Lovely to speak to you. Hope to see you properly one day. Take care. Bye-bye.